All right, here we go. Another episode of Just Do the Damn Thing. Yes. Now, this particular episode is for the caregiver. It's for the person who is either staying up to three in the morning with a child who's sick, a teenager in drama, parents who are either in a nursing home or in your home and you're taking care of them. You're a caregiver. You're a provider. You've got to come up with the answers. You're the one that's being called when someone has passed. There is a funeral and we need another thousand dollars to help cover the costs. I get it. You are feeling burnt, buried, drowning, drowned. You are, you're like out of breath, don't have enough breath, don't know where to get breath. And you're saying to yourself, oh my gosh, am I really actually supposed to build my business too? Am I supposed to really be able to build my business and me too at the same time? Stop. I created this particular episode just for you because not only do I know what it feels like, I know where you are, but I, I, I also want to say that I, I know where you are and I know how to get out of it because you can only stay flapping or flashing in the water so long before you actually drown. And I don't want you to drown because guess what happens when you drown? When you drown, everybody dies. You get it? Everybody dies when you drown. And there's a period after that. So I want you to get ready to take some notes. I'm going to lay down the raw of not only was it, what was it like, but how did I get out of it? How did I get through it? Because I spent 30, maybe 40% of the last 17 years doing it alone. As a single mom, building a business, got to six figures on my own, then got to multiple six figures on my own, leaving a place of dot, 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 dot. You know what? Let's go ahead and get started. All right. So it's like I am trying to juggle the the world. I have the world on my shoulders. I'm battling bitterness, anger, frustration. I'm sluggish because I'm mentally and emotionally exhausted. There's just not enough hours in the day. A tiny part of me, like either before I'm peeing, after I finish shower, or right when I'm parking my car was daydreaming about the me that I could see that I believed to be in my future. But all I could say to myself every day was, how the flip am I going to get there? How am I going to get there? Like, this seems so damn impossible. And what's real for me is that not only was it impossible, but it was like, I just got more and more frustrated the more I looked at people. You know, back then I didn't really have Facebook to, to compare myself to all the time, but damn it, I had neighbors I had people that I had seen. I had old friends from high school. Oh, like, like I had people who I saw and I'm looking at their life and I'm looking at my life. I'd be like, shit, this is so frustrating because I just feel like I'm alone and I feel like I'm doing something wrong and I just don't get it. And then it led to, to me, it led from me being and feeling that to maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I'm doing something wrong and I... And before I know it, I'm in this cycle of like the never ending story with no way out. And if, and if that's you, I want you to know that not only are you not crazy, but that there's a way out and you're the key in the answer. But I want you to understand that it's going to be a matter of you putting some things in place, being clear on your truths and making a simple game plan just to get to the very first level of alleviating pressure. Because if you if you don't focus on this factor, which is what will alleviate pressure, because that's the number one goal, okay? Number one goal is to alleviate pressure, understand where the brunt of pressure is coming from. And then once you identify, then you can go, okay, great. If I alleviate this pressure, X happens. And then it'll free me up to, okay, so these are the keys. So let me kind of take you down reality check lane, because Jada and mine are 18 months apart. My husband, my ex-husband, he walked out the door. So it's the months before that, I'm just kind of getting wind underneath me. We're not co-running a home. He is in the streets every other week, nowhere to be found. He barely has a job. And then when he has a job, it's like Joke City half the time. And this is after we leave Pembroke Pines. And I moved to Homestead. In Homestead, and I'm just, I'm doing my best, right? So I'm no longer going to bed hungry but I'm definitely in this space as I'm making some money and I'm making money, and, but I'm not making a hundred thousand. I don't, I don't want you to think that at all. There's been a series of just dramatic moments. There's fights, there is blood, there's broken glass. 
there is me barricading myself in a room the very last night before I see him. So I, I, but last night before I see him, before he leaves, actually, I barricade myself in a room with all this furniture. I have Jada and Maya huddled on the floor with me. I wake up the next day really committed and, and focused on getting, on something's going to give, you know, like, I, I don't know, but something is definitely going to give. Fast forward, when he leaves, like he leaves the next day. And even though I knew I was doing the right thing, because I, like I didn't, every other week, someone was like, Tiffany, I saw, I saw you on the news. And I heard about a woman and her children dying. And I thought it was going to be you. And you know, that, that, that would weigh on me. That, should have, that was tough. It was very tough for me. It was really, really tough because I knew that I was part of the problem. You get it? Like I knew every day I didn't make a decision that I was part of the problem, but I just didn't know how to make a decision. I was so flipping scared. I was so scared. So scared, so scared, so scared. One day I got the balls to do it. I do it. He walks out the door. He looks back at, he doesn't even look, but barely looks back at me, but he literally leaves, walks out the door. Jade is going to be almost 18 years old. And I still have not laid eyes on him since. And that's almost 12 years ago. Now, here's what's important. After that moment, you would think that like, my home life just became great. And I just, you know, I, I pulled my hair back and started baking cookies and the kids were like, yay, we're happy. That is not what happened. It became a shit show. And Jada was crying 24 hours a day. She was five years old. She cried like she cried. She would sit by the mailbox outside. She would wait for him to come back. Then the school wouldn't let me put her in school anymore because she was so emotionally distraught. And here I am, I'm just getting in the groove of knocking on doors. I'm now committed to knocking on a certain amount of doors every day. And I'm making about 40,000, I guess, or maybe 50 at this point. Maybe it's not quite 50, but somewhere in there, plus or minus. Real talk, it's actually the end of the world for me because it's not, this doesn't go off as I think it's going to go off. Jada is so traumatized by this experience that she, now I'm crying every other day, questioning myself, losing weight, angry, and I don't know what to do. I have to stay home with Jada. So I, so I want you to, I want you to understand that I go from, I make a decision to, I think it's going to work out great, but here's lesson number one. It doesn't always work out the way we think it's going to work out. It doesn't always happen like that. Like that's just not the way this thing goes. And, and what, the sooner that we're willing to understand that and own that back, the easier life becomes because then we don't set ourselves up because, because we have to know the process. And, and at this point, moment, I'm just learning the process. I'm learning this formula. It takes me about 30 days to get Jada semi under control. Now, here is step number one that I did. I had to start assessing what was creating pressure for me. And I started, I started assessing what's creating pressure for me and what would alleviate pressure. Because I was working, I was in a very delicate balance where I had to work a certain amount of hours. And it was a lot of hours. It was easily 12 hours a day. So I, you know, I took them to school early in the morning. I picked, I went out cold, cold all day long, got back at six and in a perfect world from six to eight, nine o'clock, I'd be doing mom stuff, but I wasn't, I was working on my proposals. I didn't have a laptop back then. So when I got back home is the only time I could work on my, my proposals, but here's lesson number two. I had to look at my time and go, okay, great. Where is my number one time? What's not getting done? What makes me feel heavy? I felt like I had to get out of the feeling of being a failure as a mom. I felt like it, like I sucked city because not only was dad gone and I had no answer for that, but the house was a wreck. I wasn't cooking every day and I actually was barely cooking. And I was like, this is getting nuts. Now I could go and clean my house and spend six hours. But I was like, I don't have time for that shit. This is crazy. I can't do that. But guess what I did? So instead of doing that, I was like, well, how much does it cost me to hire a maid? That was step number one. And I found a maid. I started asking around. Instead of going online or in the yellow books, I started asking around to people I know. Lesson number three, when you're trying to Im- introduce something new into your world, yes, you can go out into the world and do an ad and all that stuff. But I learned to ask the people that I already trust or people who are within proximity because they are a better bet than the worldwide world, right? So at that moment, I asked around, I found a woman who would come into my home. She'd clean my home. It cost me $120. It was like, th- that That was big dollars for me. $120 to clean my home a week. I would hand her the keys at like nine in the morning, come back, the house was clean. Now I did this about every other week, not once a week. This pressure of me not having to clean my house was like rule number one. I stopped cleaning my house. Listen, if you're going to grow your game, you can't be cleaning your own stuff. You just can't. And, and obviously there are exceptions to the rule, right? So like during the pandemic, no one's coming in your house, but there are other things that you do that take a ton of time and getting out of the things that mentally take you or that make you feel inadequate is step number one. 
Step number two. So after I did that, it's like, how did I afford it? Simple. I stopped eating expensive things. Jada, me, and Maya ate beans and rice maybe like five days a week. I know it sounds nuts. I wasn't cooking chicken fingers. They weren't having pizza. I was not driving them through McDonald's drive throughs Nope. Beans and rice cost me about 30 something cents a meal. And I learned how to make a really beautiful, delicious pot of black beans or red beans and white rice. Sometimes I would get cheese and lettuce and that was about it. There was no meat because meat was expensive. And I decided at that point, I was like, well, I can't afford both. So we're going to go for cleaning the house and I'm going to get rid of. So I instantly reduced my food intake or food expense by at least 50%. This was a huge deal. This allowed me to do so many things, like literally so many things. And what else is really interesting about this is that I for sure then started to work on the next thing. Because when you alleviate time, you have more time to focus on the things that make you money. For me, it was like, I'm not going to clean my house because if I, the time I spend cleaning my house, I'm going to spend putting into making more sales so I can make more money. Boom. Second thing was I cut out cooking seven days a week. And But here's the thing. I didn't take my kids to McDonald's. I, what I did is I went to Pollo Tropical. And Pollo Tropical is like, they have one in every city of some capacity. Just think of a place that'll make you a big pot of rice, a big, a whole chicken, some black beans and yuca, like some type of family dinner. It cost me $19.99. And every single Friday I stopped cooking and I made, I bought the, the big value meal so that Friday and Saturday's meals were already covered. Those two days became my, let me clean up my sales for the week days. Okay. So it was the second thing I did my sales, my little loose ends, all my little stuff for the week. So I made sure that no matter what, come Friday and Saturday, I was not ever going to cook any meals. The third thing that I'm going to that, that share with you that I did is I had to make a decision. Was I going to wake up really early or go to bed later? Listen, if you're waking up at the same time as your kids and going to bed the same time as your kids, like that's problem number one. You can't do that. You got to choose. You have to find at least an hour and a half every single day where it's just you and your home is silent. You got to decide. And I'm telling you, this is a 911. It's one of the biggest mistakes, having your kids go to bed at the same time as you, and then they're waking up at the same time as you. You need time. So for me, it was at night. I decided wholeheartedly to do this simple thing. I decided to have my kids go to bed around nine o'clock. It was tough to get us in this routine, but it allowed me to have my time. And uh, uh, unfortunately, during that period of time, I made a commitment that from about 9.30 to 12 was my time. I took a tiny little part of my world, which I'm going to tell you is rule number four. So I just, I just got committed to every single night, no matter what, this was my time. And it wasn't my time to relax. There was no time to relax during those days. No, that was Saturday and Sunday stuff. This was my time to sit down. I went through all of my proposals. I prepared the next day, the day before, every day. I prepared where I was going to cold call. I prepared I prepared the proposals I was going to give out. I typed up the letters. I dealt with drama from my, my, my ex. I dealt with drama from family. I did all of that during that time. If it couldn't fit into that time, I didn't do it. Rule number five, I had to have a dedicated place to work. You can't be working all over the place. You cannot. I carved out a tiny little spot. And I realized I've been doing this for years. You've got to have a tiny spot that's just your own where you can work and you can work silently and in peace and keep all of your things there. It's so important to have clarity in where you're working. It's so, it's literally so important. It's so vitally important. It's so vitally important. Like the truth of the matter is that you have a responsibility, 100% you have a responsibility to yourself to, to make it easy for you to win. And setting up these tiny pieces of the puzzle make it possible. Okay, let me tell you what number seven was. I know I'm going fast because I really want to make sure I pack this thing in. I think this is number seven. It's not six. It's one of the two. I for sure did not take personal calls during the day, no matter what. Mom, dad, cousin, sister, aunt, uncle, did not take personal calls during the day. Any time from eight to six, like I had to treat my job like a job. I had to treat my business like a job. I had to treat it with respect because if I didn't treat it with respect, no one else was going to treat it with respect. 
I had to be conscious of where I was spending my time, energy, and effort. So no matter what, unless my mom called like 20 times in a row and then I knew someone had passed or something very, very serious. But what happened is that they then got trained. They got stupidly trained to not call me during the day because I was like, I'm not answering. And, and it's not that I pick up the phone and I'm like, hey, 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 I'm working. Can we talk later? I actually just don't pick up the phone. It'll just ring and go to voicemail, period, period. Had to focus on money. Okay, so the next, I think we're at seven. If not, we're at eight. We're at one of them. Okay, so we're at the next one. The next thing I did, this was, this was actually really important. And it came later on down the line. I chose a day during the day where I would put the kids to do something and I would tell them, I would give them a time. So like for me, it was Saturday mornings. First thing in the morning, I would go and get groceries because that was like our fun little thing to do at Publix. Then I'd get back around 10.30 or so, 11. And then from 11 to three, I was working. And they had a project. I would put them a movie on. I definitely would put them to do something that was in another room and I was skedaddle. Setting up a routine and a structure for me was really, really important. The next thing for me was I made a decision to reach out. So this was one of the hardest things for me because up until that time, I I think I just wanted to stay in my own little head, right? Like, how do I say this? Like, when I say that I wanted to stay in my own head, it's not that I, I didn't want to connect with other people, but I was definitely afraid to share what was happening. I was afraid to explain how I felt. I was, exp- I was afraid to explain how alone I felt. So I made a decision to reach out and I reached out to one person. And then that one person, like I just started practicing talking. I know, right? This sounds nuts. I started practicing talking because up until that time, I was emotionally shut down. I was emotionally closed. I also had to find out what things I liked and I started to incorporate them. So for example, Grey Goose, I always had a bottle of Grey Goose. I know someone's going to listen to this and be like, wait, what? Are you telling me to drink? No, it's not that I'm telling you to drink, but for sure, I'm telling you to indulge in whatever it is. I'm telling you to be okay with being you. Because back then, you know, going to church on Sundays, I can remember them being like, oh, no, no, I don't drink. Because in Miami, it's like somehow it's a sin all in itself to drink if you're in certain types of churches. And I was like, I really enjoy rum. And I sometimes enjoy vodka for sure because it's cultural for me. And I remember my very first time having someone from the church come to my house and they looked because you could, you could uh, walk down the hallway, look to your right before you got into my living room and you saw my whole kitchen. On my counter, there were a couple of bottles of Grey Goose and a bottle of rum or something. And I can I remember the times where people, uh, there was a person who'd be like, oh my God, like, this is not yours, is it? Like, this must be. And and I think that there was an expectation that it was someone else's, but at that moment, it was like, no, this is mine. And it's okay. Look how happy my children are finally. Look how happy I am finally. Stop judging me. Being clear on me, and it was the fight of my life. It's like when you're trying to physically juggle it all, you have to focus on on mentally juggling it all. You can't physically juggle it all until you mentally juggle it all. I stopped apologizing. I stopped trying to be what everybody needed me to be. I started being transparent and open to my children. I started being open and transparent to my daughters. I stopped hiding. Like I literally stopped hiding. I can't even begin to tell you how much hiding I was doing during the time of trying to to cover it all. Number one, I spent my money for sure on things that gave me more time. I spent my money on things that gave me more time. I spent my money on things that stretched me more time. Second, I started spending my money on the how. How do you do this better? Third, I started spending money on support back to more time. Support, people to help me get things done so that I could do more of what I'm great at. Fourth, I stopped rattling all things in my head. Getting inside of a community is so important. I can't even begin to emphasize that. You know, you could do something on your own forever, but I'll tell you what, boy, nothing will move you further faster than getting in a community, dialing in to other people. It is one of the greatest lessons that I ever learned at that level is just dialing into other people, dialing into other people, dialing into other people, dialing in to other people, period. And you hear me emphasizing that because it's like 
sometimes we think, oh, it's like, I'm a single mom, so I'm going to go find other single moms. As a matter of fact, single moms to me, they, that, that was not the kind of energy I needed. I needed people who weren't single moms because other single moms were just dealing with their own like insecurities and, and, and like insecurity bred insecurity, fear bred fear, hatred bred hatred, belittling bred belittling. And I'm not saying there's not a time and a place for it, but from experience, that was actually the last place for me to turn. It was a hundred percent. I needed to turn to other people. So I had certain men that were in my life that I allowed in my life and I'm not necessarily, not because they were intimate. I had other women, but they weren't single moms. You get it? I needed whole people and people with other perspectives to show me something different. That's how I got stronger. By, by being shown something different, by being shown something that wasn't the norm, by being shown something that wasn't the standard. And that's really what allowed me to grow. Because here's the thing, you, re- you want to grow. You want to grow. You flipping want to grow. You don't, that's, that's the focus. If you're not growing, it's because of like, how would, I don't want to say 10 out of 10, but definitely nine out of 10 times. It's because of some fear you're holding on to, And especially this one, let me give you this bonus. I made my kids. So fast forward, because even now today, like I run a really big life and I'll probably talk about that in a bit in another episode. But for the sake of this time that we have together, I make my kids part of the process right now. My children are at every live event that I do. Every virtual event that I do, even when I pr- pr- produce Tequila with Tiffany or I produce night school or I produce, I don't know, any event that we do, webinars, how I built a seven-figure business, my kids are always a part of it. They have to be clear. They had to be clear back then. Like, this is how the game goes. This is how I create food for you. This is how I help us make sure we have a house, but I don't tell them or show them. I have them part of the process. They have to be part of setting up the room. They've got to be part of setting up the microphone and the screens. They've got to be part of testing the music and the audio. They have to be part of it because then it's like, I don't feel, I didn't feel so pressured as to I'm leaving you guys behind so I could do this thing. It was like, no, if we're mailing out postcards, trust me when I say they're putting stamps on 400 of them forever. And they're going to continue to do that. Like I have a nine-year-old, I have a 15-year-old and I have a 17-year-old. They all three have to be part of the process and they know it's non-negotiable. They also know that this is an us thing. It's not a me thing. And that really helped me to not feel so alone. Like I was carrying all the pressure and it helped me also to, to stop feeling like a failure. Like I had, I had, I had, like I was working to my family versus just working for them. I 100% the balancing act falls down to these three concepts. Number one, start paying for the how. Number two, figure out what creates the most pressure for you time-wise and financially get rid of it. One shape, one figure. If you have to be without a couch, be without a couch. When I started hiring a maid, I didn't have a couch. I want you to hear me loud and clear. When I started to hire a maid, I didn't have a couch in my home. I did not have a couch, nor did I have a dining table in that living room. Not at all. Not at all. Number three, You have to allow yourself to indulge and not apologize. Whatever it is that gets you to the next day. And and again, if you're doing, this is not about you doing something dangerous. This is not about you endangering your family, your children. No, but don't feel like you spending half the day in in your bathtub with bath salts is taboo and you shouldn't do it. Don't let anyone make you feel like two glasses of wine is going to be the end of the world for you. Don't let anybody make you feel like you listen to hardcore, you know, rap music by by Tupac, unedited is going to be a bad thing. Like, I really truly mean you have to do, like, this is just about keeping your MO, your your motive, right? Your your mojo at its prime every single day and indulging. The next thing is you got to find, you got to find people to pour into. And, and for me, it can't be the person who's like you. It can't be the person who's dealing and battling the same things because two negatives don't equal a positive. You get it? Like you definitely need, you definitely need, you need something clean and someone who is fresh and someone who has a different perspective and someone who can pour into you because they're dealing with a level of wholeness for you to be able to win. And and here's the next part of it. You absolutely want to make your, the people who are important, who are important to you, you want to make them part of the process. That is it. That's one of the things I did and I continue to do through this day. You do not have to be superwoman. You do not have to be Superman. You do not have to figure everything out, but you definitely have to take care of you. You've got to put put yourself first. 
You have to be able to. You have to be able to. And you have to do it as soon as possible because I'll tell you, if you don't do it, everything around you dies. And and the the key for us is to win, to win and to thrive. Because I gotta have you join me on the front lines. It's really just as simple. And more importantly, because I, I need you to be doing the damn thing daily. And I don't need anything to stand in the way of you winning. Man, have I told you how glad I am that you're here? Like real talk, have I flipping told you how glad I am that you are here? You have listened. This is the part of the show where I say. Go follow us, go find us, go follow us, go stalk us, but just make sure that we're connected. Head to do the damn thing dot TV, do the damn thing dot life, or just go hang out on Tiffany dot com. If we are not friends on Facebook, if you have not liked our Instagram page, go do that because you're going to want to see what we're doing, how we're doing and how we're doing the damn thing daily. 